To the casual observer, organized crime is viewed as a singular entity, spearheaded by a powerful mafioso or crime family. In reality, it's a multifaceted network built on generations of blind loyalty, spawning corruption and ruthless violence. Vito Genovese rose to the top by intimidation, but also by being allowed to rise to the top by intimidation. And the guy who allowed him to do that was Lucky Luciano. One of his mortal enemies was Robert F. Kennedy, and others at the time identified La Cosa Nostra as enemy number one of the American people, and Raymond Patriaca, remember the Kennedys are from New England, was at the top of that list. The FBI was leaking stories in the Justice Department were trying to turn him into an instant sensation, Palachi into an instant sensation. They put out a contract on him. In this episode, We'll follow the path from Charles Lucky Luciano and his merciless plot to end a brutal power struggle in New York to Joseph Valachi, whose testimony opened the vault to a world previously hidden in the shadows. The number one thing that Joe Valachi revealed to law enforcement and to the people in charge of this country was the structure of the mafia, the history of the mafia. He had a vast knowledge of it, and he was the one who exposed it all. This is Mafia. In the mid-1920s, Giuseppe Joe the Boss Massaria controlled Mafia operations in the United States. Massaria's faction consisted mainly of gangsters from Sicily and the southern regions of Italy. Such well-known members included Charles Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. Don Vito Ferro, a prominent member of the Sicilian Mafia, decided to make a bid for control of Mafia operations. From Ferro's home base in Castellamare del Golfo, he sent Salvatore Maranzano to seize control. New York Times crime reporter and author of Five Families, Selwyn Robb, shares more about Maranzano. Salvatore Maranzano came from an Italian stronghold or a Sicilian mafia stronghold in a city called Castellamarse del Golfo on the coast of Sicily near Palermo. And uh, he was a different breed. He was considered himself educated. He spoke some Greek. He spoke Latin. He was well read. Uh, he was an admirer uh, of Caesar. In fact, uh, he decided Caesar's military operations could be used the way to, to organize mafia gangs. In the U.S., the Castellamarese faction included Joe Aiello, Joseph Joe Bananas Bonanno, Stefano the Undertaker Magadino, and Joseph Profacci. As tensions mounted between the two factions, each began recruiting additional followers. On February 26, 1930, Joe the Boss Massaria ordered a young Vito Genovese to murder an ally named Gaetano Reina, with the intention to protect his secret allies, Tommy Gagliano, Tommy Lucchese, and Dominic the Gap Petrilli. This was the beginning of a brutal power struggle in New York City. It was the outbreak of a war between rival Italian gangs, Sicilian uh, gangs. It was known as the Castellamarese Wars. Dozens of bodies fell. The Castellamarese Wars saw the generational conflict between the Mustache Peets and the Young Turks. The term Mustache Peets comes from members typically having long mustaches and their interest in maintaining Sicilian criminal traditions. The Young Turks were a more progressive and diverse group, willing to work with non-Italians. Lucky Luciano viewed the conflict as unnecessary and sought to end the war as soon as possible. Luciano envisioned modernizing the mob by eliminating superfluous rules, which gained Luciano's support from those who had witnessed Massaria's flaws as a traditionalist leader. Luciano saw in his infinite wisdom that this was bad for business, that it was bringing a lot of attraction, a lot of law enforcement. You couldn't have bodies scattered all over Manhattan and Brooklyn and the Bronx without some kind of law enforcement involvement. Luciano approached Maranzano, the head of the Castle of Marseille faction, and made a deal with him that he would bump off Masseria. 
Luciano and Genovese began communicating with Maranzano. The two sides struck a deal. In return for sharing power with Maranzano, Luciano offered to assassinate his boss and take over Massaria's gang. Maranzano accepted. Lucky double-crossed Masseria. He invited him to a luncheon. Uh, Masseria was also known as Joe the Glutton. He would eat 10-course meals. Lucky, knowing his appetite, invited him to a, a regal meal in Brooklyn. On April 15, 1931, Lucky Luciano and Joe the Boss Masseria dined at a small restaurant in Coney Island. Luciano's hitmen waited outside for his signal. Lucky, at one point after the main four or five courses, excused himself to go to the restroom. When he went out, suddenly Masseria's bodyguards disappeared. About three or four uh, gunmen walked in, and that was the end of Joe the Boss Masseria. Due to the lack of witnesses and an arranged alibi for Luciano, no one was convicted in Masseria's murder. The Castellamarese War was over. Let's take a break from all the literal crime and discuss something that just feels like a crime. Leaving your much-loved furniture behind when you find a new place, simply because it's too difficult to move, and then replacing it with another cheap sofa that you maybe don't even like. Stop being that person. Buy furniture you truly love that will last from one home to the next. Furniture by Burrow is easy to assemble, easy to move. Burrow's innovative modular design and super helpful instructions make assembling and disassembling your furniture quick and hassle-free. When you order your Burrow online, you can make sure it's really made for you with thousands of ways to customize. Plus, Burrow's world-class support team is available for you whenever you need. Their sofas feature durable, stain- and scratch-resistant fabric made to withstand the wear and tear of guests, pets, little ones. Their award-winning Nomad Sofa has a built-in USB charger for all-day power. Fast free shipping on every order saves you an average of $100 on large items. Right now, you can get $75 off your first order at burrow.com forward slash mafia. That's burrow, B-U-R-R-O-W dot com forward slash mafia for $75 off your burrow purchase. Burrow.com forward slash mafia. Following Masseria's death, a meeting of crime bosses was held in Wappingers Falls, New York, where Maranzano declared himself the boss of all bosses. Maranzano also organized the New York gangs into five families. Luciano was made boss of one of those families. He leads one of them that later becomes, and now today is known as Genovese family. It's nice to know that they never call themselves by that. The mob or the mafia never calls themselves by these names. They're actually given to them by law enforcement, by the press. It makes it easy to identify themselves. If you listen to uh, electronic eavesdrop or you talk to uh, defectors, they'll tell you. What they said was, I work for Joe or I work for Al. They never say I'm part of uh, the Gambino or the Lucchese family. They know who they work for. And that's it. It's a borgata. It's a commune. It's a commune. It's a group. Former NYPD officer Joe Coffey discusses Vito Genovese's ascension as Luciano's underboss. Vito Genovese rose to the top by intimidation, but also by being allowed to rise to the top by intimidation. And the guy who allowed him to do that was Lucky Luciano. Lucky Luciano used Vito Genovese as his intimidator. It became apparent to Luciano that Genovese was not so sharp and a real thug. Genovese served by Luciano's side for five years, doing his dirty work without asking any questions. In the midst of the Castellamarese War, Gaspare Messina led the Sicilian-based mafia in Boston. 
Messina temporarily served as Capo di Capi, or the top boss, after Massaria was stripped of the title. Joseph Lombardo, a fellow underworld figure in Boston, was appointed as Messina's underboss and organized several Sicilian gangs. Gary Jenkins, host and producer of the true crime podcast Gangland Wire, shares more. They say his most important accomplishment was that he helped eliminate the powerful Irish Gustin gang. Of course, the Irish had got there earlier and, and had organized into gangs and were just now, when the Italians get there, they're moving out of organized crime behavior into uh, police work and uh, fire department and other city jobs. There was a new man arrived, uh, Filippo Bucola. He came to Boston from Palermo, Sicily. By 1932, Bucola was recognized as the leader of the Boston faction in New England. Boston family was kind of like the big brother over Providence and the rest of New England. They had their own crews and everything, but Boston family would have been the dominating family. New England mob turncoat Vinny Teresa would say that Boston's underboss Joe Lombardo had ordered Frank Butsy Morelli into retirement and with that retirement, Filippo Bucola became the boss of both Boston and Providence. So that puts those two families together, that Raymond Patriarca will eventually take over from Providence. Following Filippo Bucola's retirement to Sicily in 1952, Raymond Patriarca became boss of the New England crime family. He got an underboss who had been with the Bonanno family, a man named Enrico Tamaleo. He's also called the referee, and he would be Patriarca's underboss uh, until both of them were pretty well gone. But this gave him solid connections back to the five families and the commission. One of those connections was Frank Costello, acting boss of the Luciano crime family. In 1936, Luciano had been sentenced to 30 plus years in prison for running a prostitution ring. Vito Genovese became acting boss of the Luciano crime family until his indictment for a 1934 murder. When Genovese fled to Italy, Luciano appointed Costello as acting boss. Frank Costello was considered a gambling czar in New York, and Patriarca wanted a piece of the action. He got involved at this time with the Luciano family acting boss, Frank Costello, in the gambling business. Frank Costello was really well known to, to branch outside of New York, especially with uh, with slot machines out into the country. The commission agreed that he could have Boston and Providence at that point in time, and, and with that came the majority of New England, wherever there could be any kind of mob activities. Tim White, investigative reporter for CBS affiliate WPRI, talks more about New York's respect for Raymond Patriaca. There are the five crime families in, in New York City, and very easily, any one of them could have tried to control the rackets, the gambling operations, prostitution, the drug trade in New England. They are the most powerful crime families in the country. In May 1957, a hitman for Genovese shot and wounded Costello. The altercation persuaded Costello to relinquish power to Genovese and retire. Despite his involvement with Costello, the Genovese crime family held Patriaca in high regard. They uh, would call on Patriaca for his guidance, for his help, his advice. Patriaca even sent down one of his favorite pet hitmen to help out the Genovese family in New York City. And it was because of that that he was able to hold back New York and grow his power in New England and, and his control in this area. This summer, get the most out of your travels abroad by learning the language of your destination with Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. From ordering in restaurants or asking for directions to gaining a deeper understanding of the culture, Babbel makes the whole process of learning a new language addictively fun and easy. Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Unlike the infamous language classes you took in high school, 
Babbel designs their courses with practical, real-world conversations in mind. Speaking for myself, I've chosen to expand my knowledge of the Italian language. Thanks to Babbel's speech recognition technology, I've enhanced my pronunciation of key mafia terms and names for this podcast. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code MAFIA. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code MAFIA, for an extra three months free. In the late 1950s, the U.S. Senate established the Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management, popularly known as the McClellan Committee, after its chairman, Arkansas Senator John McClellan. Raymond Patriaca was accused of using strong-arm tactics in an attempt to remove rival cigarette vending machines and was asked to appear before the committee. He claims that he does not do that, and the reason for his success is that he has a shoebox with about eighty or $90,000 in cash that's left over from his mother's savings. That's a pretty common thing that, that mobsters used to use to beat the income tax people and explain unexplained income and say, oh, well, I've got this cash hoard that mom or dad left, and, and I'm just using it. Robert F. Kennedy served as chief counsel to the Senate's McClellan Committee. Patriaca and Kennedy were mortal enemies. Robert F. Kennedy and others at the time identified uh, La Cosa Nostra as enemy number one of the American people, and Raymond Patriaca, remember the Kennedys are from New England, was at the top of that list. Kennedy questioned Patriaca about committing burglaries at a young age. He replied, well, you know, a lot of young fellas do a lot of things when they haven't a father. Later in 1959, when Bobby Kennedy gets him in front of the commission again, Patriarcha does not take the fifth like all the others. He engages and describes himself as an honest businessman who's just hounded by the police and the press for no reason. He got national attention for that. I mean, you can, you can Google it and YouTube it and see his testimony as he's being questioned about senators, about like, hey man, what's your real job? You know, everyone says you're the mob boss. And of course he denies that and uh, took issue with it. Matter of fact, uh, a year or two later, Patriarcha took out a large advertisement in the Providence Journal Bulletin to complain about their coverage of him. And he said, like, for example, your newspapers seem to take fiendish delight in their unwarranted and unjustifiable characterizations of me. Several years later in 1963, Joseph Valachi of the Genovese crime family was also asked to appear before the McClellan Committee. Valachi was facing the death penalty for a murder he committed while in prison for a narcotics violation. Valachi claimed to be testifying as a public service, but was likely hoping for government protection as part of a plea bargain. Former FBI agent Ronald Goldstock discusses the importance of Valachi's testimony. First of all, you know, here he was on television. Uh, pointing to charts, giving the names of people. It became a central feature of Godfather II, the movie. I mean, and it's, you sort of see what occurs there. And, and it allowed people, you know, the United States is a new country. We don't have mythology the way older countries had. We had cowboys and Indians, and we had racketeers. And this was a, a way for people within the country to look at all those movies that they had seen before about the underworld and articles they had seen in the newspapers about Luciano and, and put it all together. And I think the public was fascinated by it. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy was once again at the helm. Kennedy recognized Valachi as an asset and Valachi proved his worth. What Valachi revealed was the structure of the mob. The fact that it was Cosa Nostra, the fact that it was different than the Mafia, the fact that there were families and families existed in various places around the country. He certainly didn't know all of them. Uh, in fact, when he was asked by the senator from Nebraska whether or not there was organized crime in Omaha, he sort of leaned over, talked to his lawyer, and everybody in Omaha was, what does he know? And he was just asking 
what Omaha was and where it was. Malachi revealed details only a real mafioso would know. Despite the national attention surrounding the committee meetings, Valachi's testimony was often a stark reminder that he was a cold-blooded killer. Former NYPD detective Joe Coffey discusses Valachi's biggest revelation. The number one thing that, that Joe Valachi revealed to law enforcement and to the people in charge of this country was the structure of the mafia, the history of the mafia. He had a vast knowledge of it, and he was the one who exposed it all. The families, the names of the people, the levels of uh, authority, starting with the Capo de Tutti Capi, to the underboss, to the consigliere, to the capos, down to the soldiers, and to the acquaintances, right? There were acquaintances who couldn't be made because they weren't Italian. They have a lot of associates who are, who are Jewish or Irish or whatever they are, or Greeks, who are all mobsters. They can't be members because they're not Italian. So he gave us that whole structure. Additionally, Valachi disclosed the Mafia's blood and fire initiation ceremony in which Valachi was forced to vow that he would live by the gun and by the knife. All of a sudden, everything that they had been saying, that there was no national organization, um, that crime was essentially local and it was for local law enforcement to deal with, became obviously incorrect. You had people from around the country identified, put before a grand jury, gave different stories of why they were there, were prosecuted uh, for conspiracy uh, to engage in obstruction. That was it for the FBI. I mean, if there was a moment where it was absolutely patently clear that they had a role to do that they had not been performing, that was it. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp is making professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient. Anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches by making it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. This past year has been difficult for everyone. That's why I'm so thankful for BetterHelp, BetterHelp was able to assess my needs and match me with my own licensed professional therapist. My therapist has been a lifesaver. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash mafia. That's Better H-E-L-P. And join the over one million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Mafia listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. Within his testimony, Balachi divulged that the Mafia preserved its secrets for decades through threats. Anyone who squealed would pay the ultimate price. Everything was on the table and Valachi's life was now in danger. Valachi even used his testimony as revenge for his direct boss, Vito Genovese. He disclosed that the mob boss controlled not just the Genovese family, but the Gambino and Lucchese families. Genovese placed a $100,000 bounty on Valachi's head. The mob, of course, was horrified. The leaders were horrified by what he had, uh, what he was going to do, and by his testimony. And they knew that before even he testified that he was going on the witness stand. The FBI was leaking stories, and the Justice Department were trying to turn him into an instant sensation, Valachi into an instant sensation. They put out a contract on him. And uh, you know, in the past, they had been able to reach people in prison and kill them. And they thought somehow if they met, offered enough money, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, somebody would be willing to try to bump more. Valachi's testimony was a goldmine, 
and had helped the FBI reprioritize, increasing the number of organized crime agents from four to 140 in New York. In 1968, a biography heavily influenced by Valachi's interviews was written by journalist Peter Maas entitled The Valachi Papers. Despite having a hit out on him, Valachi died of natural causes in 1971 while serving his sentence at the Federal Correctional Institution in Anthony, Texas. He was 66. Valachi's legacy resonates, not within the criminal underworld he came from, but within the law enforcement community. As the original snitch, Valachi established a new threat to organized crime, one from within their ranks, and forever changed the dynamic of syndicated crime. I'm Fleet Cooper, and thank you for listening to this season of Mafia, an Audio Boom original series. Mafia is produced by Audio Boom's Lauren Vogel, Blair Payton, Pam Burrows, and Karen Bevan. Executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Special thanks to Pascal Hughes, Gerald Zabingwa, James Tyndale, and David McNabb with World Media Rights. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows.